Adhikarna 9. Departure of one who knows the qualified Brahman. Sutra 17. Tado ko grajvala nang tat prakashitadvaro vidya samartyat tat che shagatyanusmriti yogacha hardanu grihita shatadikaya tat o kaha agrajvala nang. There occurs an illumination of the top of its that is, the soul's abode, that is to say, the heart. Tat prakashita dvaraha, having the door illumined by that light, the soul goes out. Vidya samartyat, owing to the efficacy of knowledge, cha and tat shesha gati anusmriti yogat. Owing to the appropriateness of the constant meditation about the way which is a part of that knowledge, harda anugrihitaha, under the favor of him who resides in the heart, shata adhikaya, through that nerve which is the hundred and first. Translation when the soul of the man who has realized the qualified Brahman is about to depart, there occurs an illumination of the top of the heart. Having that door illumined by that light, the soul, under the favor of him who resides in the heart, departs through the hundred and first nerve, owing to the efficacy of the knowledge and the appropriateness of the constant thought about the course which is a part of that knowledge. Doubt. The incidental consideration of the knowledge of the Supreme Brahman is concluded. Now, however, the aphorist pursues the reflections about the inferior knowledge. It has been stated that the process of departure from the body is the same for the man of knowledge, that is, of one who meditates on the qualified Brahman, and the man of ignorance up to the point where the path of the gods begins. Now is being considered the entry of the soul into that course. When the soul, identified with the intellect, that has all its organs counting from the organ of speech withdrawn into itself, is about to leave the body, then the heart becomes its abode, the place of its existence, in accordance with the Upanishadic text, completely withdrawing these particles of light, that is, the powers of the organs, it comes to the heart. Brihadaranyaka 441 The illumination of the top of the heart and the departure from such bases as the eye after that top becomes lighted up are mentioned by the Upanishad in the passage, The top of the heart of this one brightens. Through that brightened top, the soul departs, either through the eyes or through the head or through any other part of the body. Brihadaranyaka 442. Now, does this departure occur in the same way, both in the cases of the enlightened and the unenlightened, or is there any distinction in the case of the enlightened? Opponent. When under such a doubt, the conclusion should be that there is no distinction for the Upanishadic text is the same. Vedantin. That being the position, the aphorist says that though the top of the heart becomes illumined both for the man of knowledge and the man of ignorance, and though the door is illumined thereby, yet the man of knowledge departs from the region of the head, whereas the others depart from other regions. Why? Because of the power of knowledge. Should the man of knowledge also depart from any region indiscriminately just like the others, he will not attain a virtuous world, so that his knowledge will be useless. And this is so because of the appropriateness of constant thought about the course forming a part of the knowledge. In connection with certain meditations, it is enjoined that the soul's path that is associated with the nerve at the top of the head and forms a part of the meditation itself, 
has to be reflected on. And it is reasonable that by virtue of thinking on it, he should emerge through that very thing. Therefore, the man of knowledge, favored as he is by Brahman, which is meditated on as having its abode in the heart, becomes unified in thought with Brahman and emerges out of the body through the nerve counted as the one over and above a hundred. But others emerge through other nerves. That is why it is stated in the scripture, in connection with the meditation about the heart, the nerves of the heart are a hundred and one in number. Of them, the one passes through the head. Going up through that nerve, one gets immortality. Other nerves that have different directions become the causes of death. Kata Upanishad 2.3.16, Chandogya Upanishad 8.6.6. Namaste. Well, rather than try to explain all the detailed logic that goes into these sutras, it's better to put it in terms of an example, a real life example. Back in the days, there was this quiz show called Let's Make a Deal. And basically, you had three doors. Huh? Behind one of the doors is a new car. Behind another one of the doors is a goat. And behind the third door is, I don't know, some other thing, right? And the mantra is door one, two, or three. Make a choice. Is it behind door number one, or door number two, or door number three? And that's the deal. And by the way, there's also a logical and statistical, mathematical explanation for this and how it works. And actually, the host, the game host, is manipulating the contestants like anything. But anyway, that's another thing. In life, we also have three main choices. Do we want to live in a way that means we have to come back here again? in another body and go through all of this all over again? Or, <laughs> door number two, do we want to go to a heavenly planet, either the planets of the demigods, the planets of the sages, or the supreme planet, where God, in the form of the deity, whatever deity form you worship, appears there and you have personal relationship with him and or her for the rest of the life of the universe. Or door number three, behind which is Brahman. So the way we live our lives today determines which of these doors we choose. How is that? Well, by the number and quality of impressions that we gather or create, which become the seed of the next body. So if the quality of these impressions is imbued with the modes of the material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, or sattva, rajas, and tamas, that leads to the assumption of another body, after death. Why? Because the soul will have to leave the body through one of the nerves that goes back into the material world. And he goes to the moon and enjoys or suffers the results of his pious and sinful activities, and then again returns to earth, or even a lower planet depending on his nefarious activities. Someone who's really bad, you know, has to get thrown back into the animal world for a while until they appreciate the, actually, the, the, the rare blessing of a human life. Considering all the living entities that there are, that one can be born as, uh, human life is a very, very rare thing. One time, 
one of my Vaishnava teachers, this was 20 or 30 years ago, was talking about this and said, imagine in the Pacific Ocean, you have a plank of wood floating and on one end it has a knot hole. And imagine that there's a tortoise, a sea tortoise, who's been sitting on the bottom of the ocean for a long time. And I don't know, every so many days or weeks, whatever, they come up for air. What are the odds that the sea tortoise, when he comes up for air, his head will go right through the knot hole in the board? Pretty small, I would think. Those are the same odds at which one can take a human life in this world. If you view it as a lottery, you know, as a process of chance, which it's not. <laughs> but let's just say that the non-human forms are far more abundant, you know, going all the way down to the bacteria and the small worms and parasites and nasty things like that. Those bodies greatly outnumber the human in this world. And you can easily earn or deserve one of those simply by following the ways of modern life, eating hamburgers at Wendy's or <laughs> McDonald's or whatever, and similar things like that, taking intoxication and so forth. That all leads to a lower status of life. But what leads to a higher status is performance of religious activities. In the beginning, karma yoga, or sacrifice according to scriptural rules and regulations. That solves all material problems of life. Well, except the fact that you have to die. <laughs> but basically, it leads to knowledge. Knowledge leads to devotion, or bhakti yoga, in which one's heart becomes satisfied by divine love. And sinful activities are left far behind. Because, well, what's the interest in them? They only create suffering. And by this time, by this stage of spiritual advancement, one is quite convinced of that. <laughs> it becomes obvious. And then in the next stage, one goes into deep meditation. And so this is the stage beyond religious rules, regulations, and rites, even beyond devotion and metta, huh? having intentions of goodwill towards all living entities and stuff like that. Uh, even beyond Anya Bhakti. Because in Anya Bhakti, even though one worships the self, one worships it as if it's somebody else, <laughs> which I always thought was weird. And in that way treats the self as God. But even beyond that, non-dual devotion is meditation. Meditation in its ultimate form leads to realization of shunya, nothingness. Neti neti, not this, not this, not this, not this. Whatever comes up in the senses and mind, whatever is perceived is not Brahman. Neti neti, reject it. And so what are you left with? Nothing. <laughs> and people are really scared of this. I guess they equate it with death, but it's not death. Because who is experiencing the nothing? Just like in Sushupti consciousness during deep sleep at night, there's nothing. Yet we remember in the morning, ah, I slept really well. Or, oh, I didn't have a good night. My sleep was interrupted. We remember because it directly impacts our state of being, our consciousness. Even though there is no object to focus on, 
we're still conscious. We're always conscious, <laughs> indelibly conscious forever. So get used to it. <laughs> so that's like door number three. That leads to Brahman. And these are the choices we make when we choose our path in life, when we adopt an attitude for or against the spiritual path. And most people today are against it. Well, they don't understand it. So how could they be for it? Because there is a tremendous amount of propaganda of materialism and atheism and agnosticism and voidism, huh? nihilism or nihilism, the belief that there is nothing after death. Huh? What did they say? YOLO. You only live once. <laughs> Idiots. This is a direct consequence of so-called science trying to establish that the cause of consciousness is material. It's some kind of cellular, quantum mechanical something or other. Uh, or it's some kind of a network of neurons in the brain, or it's some kind of epiphenomenon of, of uh, neural activities, or, you know, some nonsense. But they cannot describe even the most basic actual knowledge of consciousness, which is that there are four states. Consciousness of the external world, consciousness of the internal world, consciousness of nothing, and consciousness of consciousness, Turiya, the fourth. That is the basic knowledge of consciousness given in the Upanishads, Mandukya Upanishad to be exact. And this knowledge underlies all the rest of the Vedic wisdom, which is why the Western scientists and religionists and politicians are so terrified of it. And through their influence on Vedic culture, have managed to reduce people's awareness, knowledge, and belief in the Upanishadic sources of knowledge. However, once you taste them, <laughs> you can never go back. You can, you can never forget the knowledge that you learn in the Upanishads because it exposes all the great secrets of life consciousness, love, identity, wisdom, and of course, what happens at the time of death. So what's going to be? Door one, door number two, or door number three? Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.